Hello, I'm Matt. And I'm Keith, and in this one we'll be comparing some real-world examples of timber price increases and chatting about lots of other stuff too. We hope you enjoy it. So, what did you achieve when you were um, at your mum's? Did you get much done? Nothing. I didn't even get there because the day before I was due to go, I had a text message going, call me when you get a chance, and she tested positive for covid she ah. thought she had a cold and she tested negative, tested again and was positive. So cancelled it. And then my sister got COVID as well. So that was Mother's Day, cancelled. And uh, I think we're going to rearrange something for Easter because Easter's really not far away now. Mm. Oh, what a shame. Yeah, so I'm glad I didn't buy any materials for this uh, project. That was the summer house project, wasn't it? That is the summer house. In fact, I have bought some materials. The kind of grids for the base got delivered today. Because she's stuck at home, I kind of thought that's a perfect opportunity because it was DPD, the delivery, so you can just specify, leave it by the shed so you don't have to come into contact with anyone. So I've got that done this morning. And uh, they can just sit outside so it didn't have to involve anyone. I'd research what a lot of people do. So concrete is kind of really bad environmental impact and it's quite expensive and time consuming Uh, I really like the idea of these kind of pillars you put in or supports I was tempted to do that but a lot of people do these plastic grids you fill with um, them I remember yeah and they're they're made out of recycled plastic and for I think I'm doing 4.8 meters by 2.4 meters and that works out just about 100 pounds in grid and then I don't know under 100 pounds in pea shingle and you've got a nice solid base but also is draining not like concrete you get standing water so i think um a lot of the big boys seem to do it that's a really clever idea yeah so it seems really simple really cheap really practical and i've not done it before so i'm gonna give that a go also this is not going to be a room that's filled with heavy bits of cast iron machinery like my workshop it's going to be a, a summer house yeah so your timber is effectively laying on the plastic that's filled with the shingle in the grid kind yeah. of thing. You yeah. could use some of those decking support pads to even raise it up a couple yeah. of centimetres and then it would never come into contact with water at all. But I don't think it'd be a problem on this because you're never going to get standing water on it. I'll, I'll see how it levels out because obviously with permitted development, you've got the 2.4 metre height because I'm within a two metres of the boundary. So I want to keep the base as low as possible so I can have the ceiling as high as possible. Yeah. But, yeah, anything to stop the base rotting is always a uh, a good thing. So, yeah, that was how successful I've been since I spoke to you last. Uh, have you done better? Um, I've been buying materials too. My auntie asked if I could make her a set of large gates. And I remembered the last large gates project I did mm-hmm. and thought, oh, do I really want to do this? But then she kind of explained what she wanted and she said that she had two large old garage timber doors that had been handmade by her ex-partner. And she said the timber in it would be really good for reusing to make the gates. I was kind of partly sceptical, but I thought, well, I'll pop around and have a look. The garage doors are made of um, inch thick decking boards as basically as cladding. Mm. Uh, And the boards are long enough to make the gates. I I kind of like the idea of making large gates from salvaged timber. It suits my channel really well. So I've been taking the garage doors apart, salvaging all of the timber from those. And then I bought some uh, tongue and groove pine to go on the front. And I'm just going to keep the gates really simple because I don't think she really wants to spend loads of money on the gates. So I think I'm just going to make it you know, really simple gate project using salvage timber for the frame, tongue and groove on the front, preservative, slap some stain on as well, and I think that'll be done. Um, although, when I got there to have a look around, as is often the case, uh, there was a problem that I wasn't expecting. So one of the gate posts was embedded into it's a kind of con- concrete driveway, and one of the gate posts come up from underneath the concrete, so it's clearly firmly in the ground kind of gave it a shove it felt rock solid so that's great went to the other side and the other post is sitting on the concrete driveway held down with do you know like metal straps that you often see in buildings so to tie the wall plate in with the wall for example yeah 
It's secured to the concrete with one of those. Just one strap. <laughs> um, but it's butted up against a fence. So I'm assuming that on the other side of the fence, there's also some fixings through to the post. Because again, when I shoved the post, it felt pretty firm. Mm. But I couldn't get to the other side of the fence because that's the neighbour's garden. I didn't have a ladder to climb up and have a look over from the other side. So it's a bit of a mystery because it looks like it's sitting on the concrete from underneath. There's a one metal strap, which obviously doesn't seem like it's going to be anywhere near strong enough to hold the gatepost. When you look from underneath, you can see that the timber's rotting from from bottom up. So well, clearly water is sitting on the concrete, the timber's sucking it up and it's just rotting. So it needs to be replaced. And again, I don't really feel confident doing that kind of work. It's, you know, fitting gate posts isn't really something that I know too much about. If it was a job for myself, I would probably tackle it, but it isn't and I don't really want to do it wrong. So I've got in touch with my cousin who's a kind of landscape gardener. He's going to go around, try and fit a new timber post um, actually into the concrete. So he's going to have to cut with a grinder a hole for the gate post to go into, set it sort of so that a third of the post is underground, concrete it all in. And then hopefully at that point I can pop back, measure up again and then and then actually make the gates. So it's on hold at the moment. That's the trouble, isn't it? You look at these jobs and go, oh, that's a simple job have got the materials knock up a couple of gates but nothing's ever that simple no. there's always all these levels of uh, complexity you don't know about uh, i saw your picture about the tng cladding on instagram and i think you did a teaser how much it cost did you actually reveal how much it cost i didn't actually um i based all of the prices on my local sawmill prices i've gone for untreated um, mainly because I know that if I order ship lap or tongue and groove and it's treated, it's going to come and it's going to be really heavy because it's going to be full of moisture. And I just don't want that problem. So that's what I'm going to do. But yeah, my local sawmill price was £9.90 a length for a 4.2 metre length. So it was going to cost me around £240. But then I found a local shed company online um, that were selling it and uh, it worked out significantly cheaper to buy through them. So... I went over there and picked it up. That wasn't a simple uh, task either, unfortunately, because they, they said they were 3.6 metre lengths hmm. and I needed 1.8 metres. So I thought, well, that's fine. I can get two 1.8 metre lengths out of each board. I went there to pick it up. We measured it. They were 3.3 metres. So they were really um, taken aback by that and they were like, oh, we'll need to speak to the supplier because we've ordered, you know, thousands and thousands of these boards. They had a pallet full of them. Yeah. And they've obviously been shortchanged out of it because on the label on the front of the pallet, it says 3.6 metre lengths and they're not. So in the end, he ended up uh, finding another pallet of tongue and groove that was new and was yet to be unwrapped. And we unwrapped that and those were actually 3.6 metres. So ended up getting what I needed, cut them all in half in the car park. It ended up coming to about £160. So oh, wow. it was a Big pretty saving. good saving. Yeah. yeah. And I often find, actually, whenever I need timber, these local shed companies that tend to buy in all of their materials in bulk often seem to sell it at pretty good prices. Mm. I'll have to think of that because I've got a fencing company in town. I might have to look into them. So that's interesting you found that. I, mean, I think with the timber price at the moment, maybe you have to be a bit creative to find different sources, which I guess has always been your thing because you... Uh, raid back alleys for snooker cues and things and i'm just tight in general really yeah same here i mean a snooker cue gate would be fascinating <laughs> that would be cool actually saying that i've been in touch with another chap who runs multiple building sites in london every time they're on a new building site they price into the job um putting up new sheathing and they use plywood um, mm. 18 mil plywood for the sheathing and then when the job's over they ship it all to his place in norfolk and they sell it on facebook marketplace um so i called him the other day because i need some 18 mil ply to make a new workbench top for my mft table so i want to ditch the mft and go back to a normal top so i called him and he said well we've only got like one or two sheets of plywood left and they're the ones that everyone's kind of left so um if you want to get in touch wednesday which is tomorrow as we speak um he'll have a new batch in then and he said come over i've got all sorts of other timber as well, three by twos, two by twos, 
you know, four by two, six by twos. He's got all sorts. So quite looking forward to popping over there tomorrow and seeing what he's got and what kind of prices he can do as well. Oh, fascinating. Oh, what a great resource. Um, so that's interesting what you're doing with your workbench because I'm about to do the opposite. You mentioned in the last uh, episode you've got the path guide system. Oh, did I? I, I forget what I've said. Uh, <laughs> this is when you get to my age, you forget these <laughs> things. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm trying to make a hybrid workbench and I'm about halfway through at the moment where one end is going to be solid timber. So when you're hammering and chiseling on it, it's got a nice solid top because I I don't know if you find if you ever do any chiseling on your mft top it's like a drum skin it's it's loud it's got a real bounce to it um yeah so i want a solid bit and then it's going to have a sheet of plywood on top that's going to be sacrificial and then the other half is going to have nothing underneath so you can have all the dog holes so it's kind of half mft half solid wood yes that's cool the idea well the top is going to be all ply but yeah. half, under half the ply is going to be solid wood under the other half is going to be more of a uh, just a frame Nice. So that you can get the dogs in. And it's going to be bigger than a normal, any bench I've had before. It's going to be um, six foot by three foot. Sorry, I'm doing old school money. <laughs> I'm just thinking of uh, uh, eight foot by four foot sheets. Yeah. So I'm thinking if you put a sheet on, it's going to overhang the ends by a foot either end and six inches either side. And therefore you can cut full sheets on it really and it's going to be supported, which I've never really had that before. Yeah, so it sounds like a similar size to my MFT table because six foot is 1.83, isn't it? I don't yeah. know what three foot is in metric. About 90. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's actually bigger than my assembly table, I think. Have you made the frame for the table as well? Yeah, and it's made out of treated timber, actually, because that was the cheapest option. It's strange how really? timber prices are so messed up at the moment that a 4x2 treated timber was cheaper than a 4x2 untreated well, wow. for workbench, it makes no difference. They tend to be heavier, I find, because the treating... Full of moisture, basically. Yeah. They will dry out eventually, though. Yeah. So, so uh, where was that you got them from? Uh, that was just one of the online big box stores, I'm afraid, because I have not found anyone local to me at all. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah. It's all just... There's a build base in town. Their list prices are horrendous and i don't know if they do that on purpose so that you can go in and go do me a deal on this mate and they knock off 20 percent, and then it's still horrendous yeah. but yeah no they're ridiculous the list prices and i just hate that just just list the price it's going to be yeah i remember a similar situation with travis perkins um I, I think they've changed their ways now but a couple of years ago i have a trade account with them log in onto their website with my trade account so they can they know that i've got a trade account you add all of the stuff into your basket and it gives you a price which is ridiculous it's ridiculously high and then you call them and they give you a totally different price when you speak to them over the phone uh, and that really frustrates me as well. I just think, well, why should I even shop with you guys if if you're gonna, you know, if you're gonna do me like that? And, I, and also, I don't like making phone calls. I'm an introvert. I don't do phone calls. <laughs> I'm, I'm exactly the same. Um, I used to use Travis Perkins, so I have limitations in this house, which I didn't really take into consideration because I'd always come to visit it during the day. And if I look out my window at the moment, the road's pretty empty. But some days when there's a van either side and I see a delivery lorry or the bin lorry comes down, sometimes they cannot get through. Oh, really? Yeah, and they have to stop and fold wing mirrors in. And I know one neighbour's had a few fines because the fire brigade can't get their emergency vehicles down. And as Travis Perkins, when they used to deliver to me, were on um, the, like the small lorries with a crane. Yeah. And I think that'd be a real issue getting it down the road. As if you order from Wix... They use a courier service that send out in vans. That's what I've had from Wix as well. Yeah. Basically, some guy with a, a Sprinter, Mercedes Sprinter or something like that. Yeah, exactly that. And it's always the same guy here and he's really nice and helpful. And uh, even if I have to park on the end of the road, because he's been here a few times, it's just so not an issue unloading it. At the moment, I've, I should apologise, actually, the next door... Uh, having a new kitchen, not no, no, not have a new bathroom and heating system put in. So yesterday was just smashing tiles off the walls all day. It's so noisy, but also vans everywhere and deliveries from large lorries with um, bathroom suites coming and things. So it had been nightmare for me to have got anything yesterday. Anyway, I hate using the big box stores, but until I found something better, it's uh, 
convenient, isn't it? And, yeah. Uh, and it's lazy, lazy of me. But I have genuinely tried to find someone local, and there just isn't. Are you still without a vehicle as well? Yes, yeah. Because yeah. uh, I don't leave the house. So uh, <laughs> I got a 4x4 a few years ago thinking that I would use it to go and pick up timber. I realised that was stupid because actually, even with the longer car, if you're getting a 2.4 metre length, it sits on the dash in a small hatchback and it sits on the dash or certainly in the footwell of a longer car. So actually, you get... 10 lengths in a hatchback and you get 10 lengths in a 4x4 it made no difference whatsoever and you can't pick up sheet goods so I was just running a bigger car for no advantage whatsoever you find these specialist things like you're saying of this shed company who are not actually a timber supplier they're just someone that has timber and you can get a great deal if you can go and pick it up so yeah there's definitely advantages to it and you've got a van haven't you I don't know what they call it, a leisure activity vehicle or something like that. But yeah, the, basically all of the seats fold flat. I can get 2.4 metres in diagonally, although I tend to put longer lengths up on the roof rack because obviously I had my old Vauxhall Combo van van. Mm. And with that, you could just throw materials in the back. It was ply line, so it didn't really matter. But obviously with my new car, it's the 2018 car so I want to kind of keep it looking tidy and nice you put any sort of timber in the back and it comes out you know and it's a complete mess somebody commented on one of my videos saying to get that corrugated plastic stuff or Corex or something I think yeah I mean Corex is a brand I think because they make um, uh, insulation boards as well but yeah I know the stuff you mean you, you just put it down as a protective sheet yeah so I've been using that but what they didn't tell me is that it rips really easily. So I bought one sheet and it's it's ruined after using it like two or three times. Mm. So I'm just trying to use the roof rack as much as possible. But the trouble is it just takes so long to tie stuff on up there um, because you want to make doubly sure that it's not going anywhere. Um, when I took all of the stuff home from my aunt's house for this gate project, I must have spent the best part of an hour tying it all onto the roof rack and mm. then and then getting it untied at the other end was probably another half an hour. So, yeah, yeah. it's a bit of a time sink. Yeah, that is the trouble. You can't have a nice car. If you've got a brand new BMW, you don't want to be folding the seats down and putting wood in it because no matter how careful you are, you're going to do a bit yeah. of damage. When I was changing cars, looking at vans, kind of got to get um, commercial insurance because no one believes you're having a van for leisure use so what you've got sounds a great option and then where my dad lives in Hertfordshire he's got a builder two doors down he's had his van broken into something like six times in a year he left it unlocked in the end but they didn't even uh, try the doors they just you know cut through the panel and stuff and crowbar things open and he kept nothing in it but oh he, he's gone for one of those tiny like a tiny van with a flat back so that it's so obvious nothing's in it because it's just not worth having one i know it's a huge problem for people in the trades at the moment it is yeah and i think skill builder are doing their part on that very subject i've seen a few videos about that um, i quite liked my Vauxhall combo because it had windows in the back so you mm. could literally walk up to it and see it was just full of rubbish reclaimed timber most of the time so nobody would want to break in for that anyway yeah you mentioned insurance, actually, the tax as well. Um, for my Vauxhall Combo, the tax was ridiculously high. Um, but obviously for my newer, newer car, it's classed as a personal vehicle rather than a commercial vehicle, and it's much, much lower. I got an exciting wood delivery yesterday. Um, there's a company who sell hardwoods online that reached out to me probably a couple of months ago now asking if um, they could work with me on a video, not a sponsorship or anything, just a, we'll send you some materials and if you could mention our name in the video, that would be great. So I picked I picked some Sapili for part of the build, but I also picked some maple because I've never used maple before. Um, so yeah, I got that delivered yesterday. It looks really nice. It's um, all packaged really well, cling film around the around all of the edges and cardboard so nothing could get damaged in transit. I'm really looking forward to starting that project uh, and making some night stands with that. Going back to timber prices again though, um, they're not the best prices but if you don't have a plane of thickness uh, or if you don't have space to run those kind of machines it might still be a good option. I'm just going to be really honest about it in the video I think. Yeah, I mean I don't have a plane of thickness uh, and 
the one I wanted, uh, which keeps going up in price because everything it does, it's close to £2,000, the Spiral Head one. And the money I'd save by buying rough cut timber, it would take me a long time to make the £2,000 back if I'm just doing little hobby projects for myself. But it's amazing how much more expensive plain door round timber is. Yeah, yeah. Is it the um, Axminster or the iTech you're looking at or Charnwood? I don't think Charn would have a helical oh, head I? one. Or last time I looked, I was looking at the Axminster because uh, I've done some kind of bits with, well, as, as we just said, they've sent me the path system, so I'm sure I could do a, a deal with them for a bit of yeah. a discount. Still horrendously expensive. And and needs a 16 amp power supply. And um, I don't have a workshop, so why am I even talking about it? <laughs> and they were also using your image in some of their promotional materials for some time. Oh, yeah, that's true as well. Without asking. <laughs> yeah, very cheeky. I've seen them put a lot about being at Maker Central, and I don't know if we brought this up on the podcast, but um, I won't be going this year, and I believe you're the same. Yeah, um, doesn't really appeal to me being around loads of people at, at an event like that, to be honest. I went to the first two, and um, yeah, it's great to meet everyone, but I think I spent around £800 each time because staying three nights at the Hilton at the NEC and then food and drink and transport didn't go home with any tools or actually I think I bought a um, like an old spoke shave for £12 something I didn't go home with anything expensive and I just don't have £800 to spend on a weekend away at the moment you could have two weeks in Croatia in the sun for that kind of money couldn't you yeah that's it but I know a few of our friends are going aren't they I think uh, Peter Millard from 10 Minute Workshop, he's got a stall, so um, definitely if you're going, go and say hello to him. Yeah, and he's being joined by Stuart from Proper DIY and Carl Pope from Carl Pope Woodcraft. I don't know who else might be there, but um, I'm sure I'm sure pretty much everyone will be there within the community. That would be a very popular stall. Thanks to ITS for sponsoring this episode of the podcast and their end of year tax savings event is now running from March 29th to the 6th of April. So it's a good time to stock up on all of your essentials. And if you use the promo code TAXYEAR, all as one word, at checkout, you can save an extra 10% on selected lines of storage, accessories, workwear and more at its.co.uk, home of all the tools you need. So the timber prices thing is it's a difficult one because I don't want to moan about things when one of the reasons timber prices is going up is um, people being driven out of their homes. And I don't <laughs> want to come across as, but what about me? And timber prices are expensive. It's a difficult one, isn't it? I think we just have to gloss over some of the causes, as in, obviously, Brexit's a, a factor. Mm. But I don't think we want to go into these things because that's very controversial. But uh, And I saw... Um, Four Wise Furniture did a, a video yesterday and they did guess how much this pile of white oak was and it was a thousand pounds, a thousand dollars, sorry, four hundred dollars. So it's it's definitely an international uh, problem. Yeah, I think he mentioned in that video that if he was doing that bed as a commission, he would have had to charge, I can't remember whether he said six and a half thousand dollars or something like that. I think that's the, the figure I had in mind. It was definitely six something. Yeah. I and mean, that's an expensive bed, but... Mm. Yeah, when you're paying a thousand pounds, well, not not a thousand pounds for materials, just a thousand pounds for that one material, and then I'm sure there's going to be a lot of other materials involved. Yeah, mad prices. Um, but having said that, I hear a lot of people saying that the costs have doubled. Some people have even said that the costs have tripled. I decided to do a little bit of um, research, looked at some of my old job costings, priced them up again based on today's prices, either by going on those suppliers' websites where I could get the prices from the websites or by calling them up yesterday. Um, and I've got some comparisons here. One is from one year ago and one is from two years ago. Unfortunately, they're all kind of framing timber, garden timber type stuff, probably because I don't tend to buy hardwoods very often. So the first project is the one year ago project, which was the large driveway gates. What I found is that certain types of timber have increased a lot and other types of timber haven't. So for example, all of the battens, the gravel boards, the framing timber and the capping timber that I bought for the gates on average have raised by 17.5% since last year. 
the shiplap has raised in price by 71% since last year. So where I was paying uh, £7.70 for a 4.8 metre length of shiplap, the price is now £13.20 a length. So 71% increase, which is significant in just a year. Um, the project from two years ago shows a similar kind of pattern, really. The framing timber for the roof framing, the wall framing. On average, that was 31% more expensive now than it was two years ago. The shiplap was £327 back then. On today's prices, £610, so 87% higher over the course of two years. The plywood and the OSB had both raised by about 51%. That obviously shows how things have changed over one year and two year. What I don't have a comparison of, which would probably be more interesting, would be like a four or five years, because then you've got Brexit, you've got COVID, and you've got the war on Russia as well, which have all affected prices. Yeah, I think so. And also there was um, the wildfires in America, I think, affected the prices as well. That's right, yeah. It's just been a crazy few years with yes. uh, things going on. You lose track of it all. I, I just remember from my workshop build, which was three and a half years ago, a three by two that's 2.4 metres long, you get for about £2.20. <laughs> as now, it's pushing five quid as yeah. a list list price. I mean, you might be able to get it much more, but it was £2.20 kind of as a list mm. price. So it's over doubled in price. From what you're saying, most things have, over the last three years have doubled in price. So my workshop that cost me three and a half grand to build would now cost seven grand to build. Yeah, and, 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 and also all of the prices that I've just gone through are all kind of pressure-treated garden-type timber rather than construction timber. So three-by-twos are a great example of, of another thing that would have raised far more than that because obviously anything construction-related uh, uh, tends to be the things that are going crazy. So yeah. OSB, for example, used to be £18 for an 18 mil sheet it's now over 40 i think yeah i guess if you're in the trade you've just got to pass all these costs on to your customer plus your fuel costs and every other cost you've got so getting anything done at the moment must cost a fortune i was looking at some rough sawn oak the other day and it hardly had gone up since the last time i bought it about a year ago like the the, the amount i wanted i think was perhaps 220 pounds last year and now it's 250 pounds so it's gone up but that's kind of almost what you'd expect things to go up yeah just with inflation yeah, yeah. it does seem then that it mainly is your softwood construction kind of materials rather than your hardwoods yeah i think that's it by this time next year then when it comes to being time to build your workshop you might be able to build it all out of oak <laughs> yeah that, that'd be nice wouldn't it <laughs> I mean, I'd never even considered that, but at the moment, it actually makes, it's going to start to make sense soon. <laughs> Just hope no one else realises that. Tim from The Restoration Couple, I, I've seen him do oak framing before yeah. in various jobs, and yeah, I'd love to do something like that. And He, he does those massive mortise and tenon joints and, and all of that lovely stuff, which must take an awful long time to put together. So I think with pricing... One more thing is I've been waiting for prices to come down. I was thinking the disruption from Brexit will settle down. The pandemic's coming to the end, or in theory, even though everyone's dropping like flies at the moment, things will get better. But then obviously the war in Ukraine and there's always another thing. And prices, I think when they go up, they never come back down to what they were before. So I've been holding off on the workshop build, but probably I'm going to end up regretting it because prices are going to be in even higher in a year's time than now. So I don't think if you wait for things to to uh, be cheaper, probably that's not how the world works. You were, you were saying about your landscape gardener friend. Mm -hmm. um, I have a landscape gardener friend as well, and he always sends me pictures of pagodas and things. He's, he's timber framed out of oak. Because his dad was a carpenter. So it's it's very nice. I mean, it, you hear Landscape Gardener, or I did a few years ago, I was like, oh, he's just planting flowers or th something. Like, no, it's basically, it's construction in yeah, a garden. a lot of it is, yeah. Yeah. I'd quite like a little lean-to. I think I've said this before, out the back. Yeah. So maybe I could timber frame that, because there would be no huge rush to get it done, like the workshop. I also feel, because I'm building it in my back garden, 
I don't want to spend months building the workshop of doing a bit each day to annoy people. I want it to be one short, sharp shock of two weeks of construction. Yeah, it's very considerate of you. (laughs) Wow. I try. It's it's, it's strange. Last weekend, uh, I hadn't met some of the neighbours a few doors down and then everyone was just sat out the back door. (laughs) <laughs> and, I, I, and everyone's out doing gardening so it's quite nice but um that's the trouble of doing things in the summer people actually want to be outside it, it's give and take i mean the neighbor's ripping out his bathroom and my walls are vibrating while he's mm. chipping tiles off so it works both ways doesn't it these things yeah i remember when i was in the terraced house with the workshop at the bottom of the garden often my neighbor would poke her head over the fence and just say we're having a barbecue later. Would you mind um, not using any power tools? And I, and I'd be fine with that because you know, let's face it. In the UK, you don't get very much time to enjoy the sun in your gardens, so I, I don't want to be a hindrance to that. So often, I'd either try and find a hand tool project that I could do on that particular day, or just not do any work. But obviously, if you're in a full time job and you've only got the weekends and evenings to do your hobby, it it can be quite restricting at the same time. But I'd much rather have neighbours like that who wanted mm. to talk to you yeah, uh, rather than they just got, got angry and stewed about it and complained to the council. But now we've got the great position where we can just make noise during the day, uh, weekdays. But I bet no one overhears you in your nice brick insulated workshop. Yeah, but that's mainly due to the noise of the road that it's next to. I mean, you get motorbikes and lorries that come past that shake the bones of the house and uh, I I could never make that much noise in my workshop. So it's quite a nice setting, even though obviously living next to a really busy road isn't ideal in many ways. And also it's quite rare to find a house where the outbuilding is at the front of the house. Um, Mm. It also works really well for delivery. So, for example, yesterday I had a call from the delivery driver just before he arrived. If you pull up on the road, I'll come out and give you a hand with it all, load it all in on my own and then um, salvage the parts from the pallet that everything was sitting on as well. (laughs) The pallet it came on actually was uh, something that had been constructed from three kind of three by three bits of pine and then just scraps of plywood on top. But mm. some of those scraps of plywood were birch ply. And it's like, someone's used birch ply to make a pallet. And um, obviously I've salvaged it, but it's cut, it's got loads of screw holes in it, which is unfortunate. Yeah, I'm sure I'll get used for something. I mean, it sounds like your house is perfect for what you do. Actually, the noise from the traffic thing is only going to get better as the years go on, isn't it? When uh, electric cars or alternative fuel uh, things that was a technical term, (laughs) (laughs) come along, it it would be less diesel lorries shaking the place, won't it? Hopefully so, yeah. But yeah, I definitely learned that, well, this house was a bit of a rush purchase, but it probably isn't absolutely ideal with the the road getting deliveries, but it's fine, and I'm just going to have to work around these problems. So we've got a question from Christopher Elliott around advice about building sheds, garden rooms, outbuildings. He's going to be demolishing his current shed, salvaging what he can out of it, and then building a new structure in its place. Um, Just wondered if you had any essential tips, especially on ventilation and damp proofing. I think the key tip I would give is go and watch Gid join us videos, (laughs) because that's where I got most of my information from. That, that's good advice. Ventilation is very complicated and it's, it's different what so many people say because you're trying to keep the size of the walls down to the absolute minimum. So with air gaps and things like that, there's kind of what you should do in your house worth versus air gap. But your house has a kitchen and a bathroom and people are sleeping in it. I think you can get away with a bit more in a shed because yeah. it's not a high use space and you're not creating a huge amount of moisture. But I've certainly done ones where I've got the studs and I've put pushed the insulation right up to the uh, wall. But technically, I think you should use leave a gap and things. Right up to the cladding on the wall? Yeah. Right. Would that matter if it had a vapour barrier, though? I don't know. You, yeah, vapour barrier, I think, would definitely help. So if it was like the Kingspan stuff or whatever? Yeah, if you foil up the Kingspan, I think that can act as a vapour barrier. But again, I've I've done it and I've never had a problem because... Yeah, you're not 
cooking and having showers in there so that the, the and you have the door open probably a lot of the time so it's ventilated um so my last workshop i put no vents in it whatsoever but i bought windows with the what were they called trickle vents the vented windows yeah. i bought and that i thought that's just the easiest way of having ventilation in it did you have did you build ventilation into your old workshop I left some air gaps right at the top of the roof um, and I did that mainly because it had a metal roof and I wanted the airflow from front to back to try and avoid the issue of condensation but it didn't work um, because essentially in the winter the air has so much moisture in it naturally anyway that condensation just happened and it was a real problem until the point when I basically glued polystyrene insulation sheets to the underside of that metal Mm. um, and that completely solved the issue for me on my first workshop and then when I built the shed two years ago I added a vent on each end basically but after one year I had horrendous mold issues on the plywood ceiling and on the roof rafters and I had to clean all that mold off with a proper mold spray thing and that was a horrible job because working sort of upside down cleaning a ceiling with nasty mold Mm. chemicals dropping on your face it's just it was awful so i ended up drilling in loads of extra soffit vents which are the circular i think they're about maybe 60 or 80 millimeters putting loads of those in the wall hoping that would solve the issue it's now been another year since i made that video about the mold and it's absolutely dry as a bone in there it's absolutely perfect but i don't think it was necessarily adding extra vents that solved the issue I think it was because when I built the workshop, the wood that I used had so much moisture in it because it was pressure treated. Mm, I think it was just building up. And I think that mould issue was only going to be an issue on the first year of build. Now that the wood is nice and dry, I don't think that problem will be will be back again. That's the trouble with pressure treated timber. It's 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 moist because of the treatment. Plus, it's always stored outside. Mm. And sometimes the things are sodden and then you have a lot of problems with shrinkage. Yeah, it's a real problem, pressure treated. You were talking about the cladding and it could be a real problem with it. Yeah. You, you, you do your gauge and then everything cracks and um, shrinks up. I got a lot of comments on the video saying, why didn't you use a membrane? It's like, well, it's a shed. You know, I'm not going to be living in it. It's a storage shed for garden tools. And people are like, well, you're going to get wind coming through and moisture it's like well it's not an issue it's a shed if if moisture comes through it, if it finds its way in it's going to dry out anyway because there's yeah. airflow so well that's how every single commercial shed is built mm. um yeah but uh if i was building a workshop i think the cheapest thing to do is to put a vapor barrier up because it's yeah i don't know one by one and a half meter well i'm talking old old prices they've probably gone up hugely but one and a half metres by 50 metres roll, which would probably do pretty much any workshop you're going to build, yeah. was 50, 60 quid, stapling mm. that on. So everything I've built, the shepherd's huts and the workshops and things, I've framed it three by twos or whatever. Then I've sheathed it with OSB. Then I've vapor barred it. But I see a lot of um, people that make some very nice buildings professionally. They three by two or whatever frame it then they don't sheathe it. They just put more noggins in and vapour bury it. And then you don't tend to get any moisture condensing, I guess. All right. Because then you batten it and then you put your whatever oh, cladding so on. The battens give the air gap, kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, battens that give the air sense. gap. Yeah. But yeah, we're no experts, are we? We've both done things and made mistakes. So what we found in YouTube, no matter what you do... People will tell you you've done it wrong. Yes. And if you did it that way, another group of people will tell you you've done it wrong. And even when you're searching for the right information, you will find conflicting information. And, and you'll, you'll find someone saying, listen, I've been doing this for 50 years. This is the way to do it. And then someone else saying, no, no, I've been doing this 70 years. I do it this other way. And you never know what, who to believe. Um, so the best you can do is really find someone that you feel like you can trust the advice of. And, and listen to them and learn from them. Um, the other things I know, timber touching the floor is is always going to rot. Um, mm. If it's concrete, moisture's going to sit on it and the moisture's going to draw into the timber. If it's sitting on soil, insects and bugs are going to eat away at that timber. 
even if it's pressure treated, eventually they're gonna they're gonna get into that and start eating away. Um, I've actually set up an experiment which I'm really excited about. I've put some some untreated wood and some treated wood samples outside in my garden in various settings. So some of it is sitting in a bucket of water, some of it is sitting in direct contact with the ground, and some of it is buried in the ground. And I want to leave it a couple of years, come back to it and do a video about it and, and see how each piece of wood has deteriorated over time. Um, because a lot of people out there say that pressure treatment nowadays isn't anywhere near as good and as effective as it used to be because I think it used to contain arsenic or something like that, some really toxic chemical. And the stuff that gets made nowadays is obviously in line with current regulations and it's been um, made more and more safe over time and it's just not that effective. Yeah, you've just got to try and mitigate these things, haven't you? So that's mm. why I'm saying I like this the idea of this base that's draining but with the old workshop, I had it on those plastic decking supports, which are really quite cheap, so it's never touching the ground. Or even if you've got a concrete base, you could put some concrete slabs that just lift it off slightly. Yeah, uh, yeah there's lots of things you can do. A shed put on soil might only last 10 years, but if you put it on a concrete base on some um, raised up on some blocks, it might well, it'd probably blow down before it's going to rot away. Yeah, I also really like that clear preserver treatment. Um, Sikaguard do one. I think it's called Five Star Treatment, and I think Everbuild do one as well. It's about probably 30 quid for five litre tin of it. You just paint it on, it disappears, and you forget you've ever done it. I remember Gid actually saying to me he's seen insects crawl onto that stuff and just shrivel up and die instantly. So wow. it really does keep the bugs away from eating the timber usually it needs like two or three coats and you need to kind of coat it wait for it to dry and then coat it again definitely treat your cut ends as well so if you're using pressure treated timber and you make a cut that freshly exposed end grain is going to be the most prone to rotting so slap loads of preserver on that as well I'm going into wood finishes now because it's just something I, I get so excited about and I know most people are probably really bored by people talking about wood finishes but the other thing I would say is that don't necessarily think you're doing the right thing by applying paint to the timber or stain to the timber. I like to treat it with preservative and a stain or paint, but the trouble with that is over time as the timber moves, you're going to get small cracks appear in the wood and that's a place for moisture to get into. And if it's painted or stained, then the water can't evaporate that effectively because it might get sealed inside the timber. So that, that in itself might lead to rot. Um, whether painting timber is actually preserves the timber longer or not than not painting it, I don't know. That's, uh, that's another test I'd like to do. But the trouble with these tests is you set them up on day one and you have to wait for five, ten years before you've got any, yeah. any results. Will YouTube exist then? Like most of our um, bits of advice, it, it sounds like we're just trying to put people off them ever doing anything there's I, I think with a shed because it's a low habitation space you can't go that wrong mm. and you can always add probably more ventilation but yeah we waffled for half an hour and the conclusion is don't listen to us <laughs> oh we've got a comment on youtube as well from alan stevenson in the last episode we were talking about the spam that you can do with various size timbers and he's given a rough guide for calculating the joist size, which is really good. And I've heard this before, actually, but it's one of those tricks that I must have forgotten at some point. But if you half the span, so for example, for a 12 foot span, half the span is six, you add an inch. That means you need a seven by two joist, which, yep. is, which is quite a clever trick. Although I think I've heard add two inches to that before as well. So I don't know how reliable this trick is, but... Um, I guess it depends how whether the roof is going to be load bearing or not for one. Yeah. So for yeah. example, you mentioned for your carport, wasn't it? Yeah. That's it. I was worried about the carport and then I realized how stupid I was being because the bits of timber all they're doing is sat there. It's decoration yeah. really. They they've got no load, so if a can t timber can support its own weight, then it's fine. I mean, a 4 by 2 might sag over time, I guess, potentially, but I think anything more substantial than that would be okay, I would have thought. I would have thought. It's not going to have to bear any weight from snow or anything like that because it's not going to have a roof on it, is it? No. 
I've got someone saying that the uh, the Koki cordless uh, plunge saw comes out later this uh, year and the Makita 40 volt doesn't work on the 18 volt and vice versa which was obviously something you were keen about yeah. yeah so I think if you got the Makita 40 volt batteries they would probably work in the 18 volt tools mm. which is the way that Hikoki works because the multi-volt 36 volt batteries work on the 18 volt but not the other way around well uh, Debbie says it, that won't work uh, which okay. is really disappointing because then there's no real particular advantage for you for getting a getting a Makita one. If you need a separate battery and a separate charger, it yeah. doesn't really matter what colour the tool is, does exactly. it? Exactly, yeah. So someone that is going to be at Maker Central is John Made It. Uh, he's got an Instagram thing and what he's doing is Maker Jenga where he's given dimensions for these large, giant Jenga bricks and he's trying to get lots of people to make their own Jenga brick and then they're going to have a massive game of make a Jenga with all these different bricks. So if you've got an idea how to make a Jenga brick, you can take it to Make Central and join in. So go to the John Made It uh, Instagram page and uh, have a look at that. Shall we move on to what we've been watching? Ah, yes. Hooked on Wood. Do you watch his channel? Yeah, Dennis, I think. I'd watched his things before because he's got very popular by doing the um, China Tools episodes oh yeah but anyway his latest video was called perfect dust extractor for an average workshop and he's looking at the camvac owned by record power now and he makes a i think he calls it a whisper box and because they have an exhaust port on them as actually i had like other vacuums that the exhaust is just all the way around the lid there's no one Mm. place there's no port there's no port yeah because this has a port, he has it going through this whisper box. This like a, a car exhaust, I suppose. And it just really quietens it. And it means you can put the vac in a box without it overheating because you're still exhausting all the uh, air outside. So I thought that was really good. And when I get a bandsaw, I'm going to build a stand for it and have a vac slash whisper box built into the stand I think because the bandsaw is a pretty quiet machine it's the vac that's noisier and those record power vacs from my experience are really loud I yeah mean, I, I had the little one the SX 1000 or something but that I had to get rid of it it was just too loud for my liking I bought a cam vac twin motor one because you've got twin motor mm. pneumatic haven't you and they're great but they're it's a single switch isn't it for both the motors it's uh, it's just yes. it's just on yeah. the cam vac I had the uh, one before that's um, had the bag and I didn't like the bag because it had to be wall mounted as now I've got a canister one and it's got a uh, switch for each motor because most of the time you only need the one motor yeah uh, um, so it's really good but what he's saying which is I think is a very good point that this in theory could work on every machine in your workshop you could plug it into your random orbital sander and you could plug it into your 10 inch thicknesser and it would do everything so it's really good anyway he, he does well produce videos yeah and he's building his dream workshop at the moment which looks very interesting excellent what have you been watching yeah so i've just seen uh, sam at monkey boys workshop has started a youtube channel so i think we've both been following him for a few years on instagram but he's uh, made the transition over to making some longer form content on youtube and if you're familiar with Sam's Instagram page. You'll probably be expecting lots of high energy, positive vibes and happiness, and that's pretty much what he delivers. And he's got some great videos on there already. I think he uploaded three or four videos on his channel already. I'm glad you reminded me because I've seen all his posts about YouTube, and then I've always been away from the computer and not um, clicked on to subscribe. I also saw they're expecting a workshop exists. Ex- Apprentice? Apprentice assistant, assistant, I was going to say. They're expecting a workshop assistant. So congratulations. Congratulations. If you enjoy the podcast and you'd like to help support and shape future episodes, you can find a link to our Patreon page in the show notes or just search online for Workshop Banter Patreon. You can find Keith on YouTube by searching for Rag N Bone Brown and me by searching for Badger Workshop. And we have a Workshop Banter Instagram and Facebook page. If you'd like to get in touch, 
which is at Workshop Banter, all one word. Thank you for listening.